feeling. You like the feeling of it? Yeah, yeah. I like what the feeling. Look at that. That's very nice. Look at those things. This is me as. Oh, hi. <laughs> We're live already. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we got about five minutes before we start reading the gospel and the commentary. We were just admiring the work of some of my kids here. They uh, recently came from the, uh, what do you call that? Pottery Magic, Magic thing during the birthday of uh, my daughter, Jana. So we just got their their uh, artwork. I mean, the uh, painting they did, you know, here's the ceramic, the la uh, final product. Okay, after it was all baked. The cupcake of Chevelle, look at that. It's okay. Nice. Uh-oh. Don't, do, don't, and, and, do, do don't do it on the green part. Don't do it on the green part. Here is uh, Joseph's cup, which, uh, as you might tell, uh, is, is like a chalice. This guy wants to become a priest. Please pray for him that, uh, you know, his vocation might, oh. might, oh, might yeah. flourish and prosper. So he likes uh, practicing how to say Mass. So here is his chalice. that made his own chalice. And what have we got here? Whose is this? Oh, this is Jana's. There you go. It's got her name there. Jana. And whose is this? Oh, this is mommy's. <laughs> no, who made this? Who made that? Oh, Jana also oh, made Jana. the other cup. Yeah. Jana made it. Huh? Yeah. What? Oh, what's the other side? Oh, sorry. Okay, they wanted to show that this is... This is Apparently the official cup of their band, Clutch Company. Yeah, that's okay. Clutch Company. Hey. That's the name of our band. Okay, Joe. No. Well, it's, oh, oh, sorry, I forgot Sophia's frame. See, there, Sophia made that frame too. It's gonna yeah, be. And it has you a can put on you it. can put a picture in the middle of that. Okay. Okay. You'll never know the value of a moment till it's a memory. That's a quote from. Dr. Dr. Seuss. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. Okay. There you go. Well, I think this is, uh, oh, it's going to be, it, it can it can help uh, as, a, as a stand for me today, honey. There you wow. go. Okay, Joe, go to your seat. Okay. Yeah, well, 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 we're still a few minutes ahead, but uh, let's uh, let's go right ahead and start, start today's commentary. Let's go. So, <laughs> because it might actually be a long, uh, long commentary just depending on how things flow I hope I don't get carried away with this topic but it is a topic that's very close to my heart so uh, let's go right ahead and jump in okay the gospel is from st. Matthew uh, chapter 19 verses 3 to 12 okay some Pharisees approached Jesus and tested him saying is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause, whatever? Divorce. He said in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female? Very clear, right? The Creator made them male and female. There was no third sex. There's nothing in between. There's nothing uncertain. Uh, uh, that statement is very categorical, right? He made the male and female. So we got to pray for our friends who don't seem to understand where they belong. <laughs> we got to pray for them, really. Okay. Uh, for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. They said to him, Then why did Moses command that man, the man give the woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? He said to them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, um, unless uh, the marriage is unlawful and marries another, commits adultery. His disciples said to him, If that is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. He answered, Not all can accept this word, but only those to whom that is granted. 
Some are incapable of marriage because they were born so. Some because they were made so by others. Some because they have renounced marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can accept this ought to accept it. Very clear indication. Our Lord says, not all can accept this word, but only those to whom that is granted. What does that tell us? Marriage is a vocation. It is something granted by God to those whom he calls to the marital state in life, to the marital state of sanctification. Let us put marriage in the context, let us put the marital vocation in the context of the meaning of one's life. Our baptismal calling is a calling to sanctification. We are all called to sanctity. The only question is, what path do we follow? What path is God calling us to follow on this earth to sanctify ourselves in? For a lot of us, it has been the calling to marriage. Marriage is a vocation. And our Lord states it very clearly in this gospel. It is not given to all. It is given to those whom He has called to that vocation. It is a calling. It is a divine calling. It is a gift from God. To one man and one woman. Okay? Not to a threesome. Not to a man and a man. Or a woman and a woman. Or not in any other combination. It is one man and one woman woman now marriage is a very serious very serious calling serious to the point that you have to leave father and mother to be joined to a spouse to your wife and the two shall become one flesh it spells a serious commitment to bind oneself you're leaving your comfort zone you're leaving your parents you're leaving the people who are dearest and closest to you uh, uh, who, with whom you share a, a, a specific uh, and intimate bond from the time of your birth. You're leaving all of that to cling to your spouse. Now that, that requires a very, a very determined, a very mature, and a very solid manner of commitment. Okay? One thing I'd like to add to this, and uh, this is just the fact of my own experience, is that marriage is a leap of faith. Marriage is a leap of faith. Because it is a, it is a move, it is, a, it is a, a, a course of action that requires abandoning yourself in the hands and in the providence of God. To a great extent, it is an abandonment to the providence of God. You are not going into marriage on your own. No one goes into marriage, especially if it is a marriage blessed by God through the sacrament of marriage in the church. No one goes through marriage alone. It takes three to get married. The couple, man and woman, and God there to bless that marriage. So one would be foolish and immature to think that marriage is all about pleasure, that marriage is all about satisfying oneself, that marriage is all about having a good time with your spouse. Okay? That is not what marriage is all about. It is not a bed of roses. It is definitely a path with plenty of challenges. Uh, it is definitely an adventurous path, which uh, <laughs> my, my wife and I know very well about. It is very much a challenge. It is very much um, a, a, a path to sanctity. A path where really we could um, learn not only to, not only, we, we won't only learn many things about ourselves, but we will learn plenty of things about the person we had chosen to love for life. The person that God has shown us to love for life. That is why um, it is, it is uh, very important to understand that marriage is a vocation. It is a vocation that is by nature ordained to the procreation and education of children, primarily 
and the mutual help of spouses. Those are the primary purposes of marriage. Okay? The primary purposes of marriage are for children, the, education, the, the procreation and education of children, and the mutual help of spouses. So people who enter into marriage okay, with the mentality right away of, oh, I don't want to have kids, or, oh, I'm only going to have two, ch two kids, those people are starting on the wrong foot when they enter the marital state. Okay? Those people are entering marriage with a wrong, very, very wrong idea of what marriage is all about. Okay? Our faith teaches us that marriage is a vocation that should welcome children. It is a vocation that should not impede and stop God's creative uh, uh, design for the couple. Okay? If, we, if we put obstacles to God's uh, creative purpose and we do not allow ourselves to be part of God's creative purpose by, by welcoming children into the world, then we are not fulfilling the purposes of marriage. We are not. We are becoming obstacles to, to God. We are becoming obstacles to God's creative design. Okay? So, uh, marriage is, is a school of virtues too. Okay? As I said earlier, marriage is a path to sanctity. And the, the real, you know, really when it comes down to it, why is marriage a path to sanctity? Because it is a path for growth in virtue. Because it is a path where we can exercise plenty, plenty of virtues that, uh, that can help us become saints. Okay? That is why when I hear the, uh, people divorcing because they say, Oh, we have irreconcilable differences. Oh, we have so many things that are, you know, we disagree with and we keep fighting. You know? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can't help but conclude that these people perhaps entered marriage without understanding the real meaning of marriage okay? without understanding what they signed up for to begin with okay? and I often uh, give the example of my own grandparents you know I, I don't know of any other uh, incompatible couple uh, who ever got married than my own my own grandparents I have a grand my, my grandparents Aaron and Victorina okay, let me just tell you the number of ways they're incompatible number one I have a my grandfather is Russian my grandmother is Filipino. My grandfather was a highly educated man. He was an engineer. My grandmother only finished the equivalent of a second or third grade education. My grandfather did great things. He was a war hero even before that. I mean, of course, he, he was the one who con he, he constructed Malinta Tunnel. He constructed Angat Dam. He constructed uh, many other things uh, in the Philippines. A great engineer, a great prof uh, professional. My grandmother was a seamstress. Was a seamstress. Right? So professionally, they were so incompatible, if you'd like to think of it that way. Right? Um, uh, my grandfather, Grandpa Aaron, was fluent in 10 languages. Chavel, you know how to count to 10 already, right? Yeah, 10. <laughs> but well, I could even hardly speak two languages, but my grandfather apparently was fluent in 10 languages. My grandmother only knew Filipino. Tagalog. So, Tagalog, yeah. So how did they even communicate, right? How did they even express their love for one another? And maybe here is the biggest difference. My grandfather was a Jew. He was a Jew. In fact, he even served as a rabbi in the uh, concentration camp when he was incarcerated there in World War II. My grandmother was a devout Catholic. Catholic, Jew. Woo! <laughs> what more incompatibility can you ask for? Right? Yet, yet, this very faithful and happy couple engendered and welcomed 10 children into the world. 10 children. And I would like to think if only the war did not break out, I would like to think they could have gone ahead to have a dozen children, maybe 15, maybe 20 kids, <laughs> because they loved children and because they understood what it was to get married. 
Now, with all of their differences, you can just imagine how both grandpa and grandma had to put up with each other, right? How they had to put up with each other. And, and many times, many times uh, I hear the stories, you know, grandpa composed many songs in Filipino, right? Many Filipino songs. And apparently, apparently, uh, whenever they would have a disagreement with uh, um, grandpa and grandma would have a disagreement, he would sing one of these songs that uh, he composed precisely for that purpose. See? Lala ka nang lala, wala kang maalala. And how does it go now? Uh, hey, hey, uh, Tito Sonia and Papa, please remind me of how it goes. I forgot. Okay? Uh, lala ka nang lala, ikaw na ang bahala. See, of course, that's in Filipino. That's Tagalog. But uh, my grandfather composed that kind of a tune. Okay, every time that apparently they would have disagreements and he would just sing it off, right? Well, there is virtue for you, making, making uh, uh, life easier and fun even in the face of disagreements of that sort. So, hey, this, <laughs> this, this excuse, we are incompatible, ditch it, bury it if you're married. It just is not a, a, a good excuse. Okay, now, okay, what else is there? Um, uh, don't be afraid to have children. Folks, don't be afraid to have children. Marriage is all about children. Marriage is all about having children, engendering them into this world, educating them, and working for them. Working for them. The wrong mentality that exists nowadays in plenty of couples is that when they begin their marital life, okay, they immediately limit the number of children because they are working on the wrong economics. Okay? They start off by asking themselves, well, how much can I pay for? How many mouths can I feed? Oh, at the state of my professional life now, I can only afford one. So, okay, let's just plan for one and that's it. You know, folks, very wrong economics, okay, to say the least. What you have to do is plan for a big family. You know why? Because that means you have a goal to work for. That means you have, a, you have something to work for. You have a goal. If you limit your, your, your family size immediately to one or two, well, guess what? You just limited your potential. You just stopped working. You just stopped dreaming. You just stopped developing yourself. But if you start your family life, with a big goal in mind to achieve. You know the effect of that, folks, on you? You will work your butts off. You will work hard in order to achieve that goal. And look at all the benefits of it. Look at the kind of... <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I only have my own situation and my wife's situation, our family's situation to show as proof that if you do not put hindrances and obstacles and, and limits on God's creativity and providence, you are going to reap the fruits of your own generosity. Let us be generous to God when it comes to children because God can never be outdone in generosity. Never, folks, never be outdone in generosity. And I have my own testimony to tell about that, but this is not the time. One last thing I'd like to, uh, to ask and to, and to really put across to people, especially people who are in charge of marriage preparation programs in your parishes, in your communities, in your churches. Folks, it's about time we take this marriage preparation courses more seriously. In my experience working in many, several parishes already, <laughs> the marriage preparation programs is a joke. It is a joke. I'll repeat, it's a joke. People are not being told what the marital vocation is all about. People do not know what they're getting into. People are ignorant of the very nature and purpose of marriage. That is why it's no surprise. It's no surprise that there are many divorces. It's no surprise people, uh, couples separate. It's no surprise that we don't have children anymore. 
It's no surprise that our churches are not populated with children anymore. No surprise. It's because marriage preparation courses are not doing a good job. And, 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 and I have plenty of experience to say so. I, I used to give baptismal preparation classes in our parish for years, for years. And I yet have to find, every time I start that class, I always begin with asking about marriage. And I yet have to recall any couple who ever gave me a satisfactory answer as to why they got married and whether they understood what, what marriage is all about. Okay? So I challenge everybody who is part of a marriage prep program, please look deeper, look deeper into your marriage preparation courses because there is a lot of work we need to do. We cannot blame society. We cannot blame the environment. Let's look deeper into ourselves and ask ourselves, what work are we doing in our own environments, in our own parishes, in those groups that we can control? What kind of programs are we offering? Let us not pay lip service to this very grave duty. We got to do our work. And you know what? Let me tell you this. Let us start while they are young. Let's start while they are in the courtship stage. Let's start with people who are teenagers. Teach them the value of the vocation to marriage. As well, you expand it too. You teach them about the vocation to other things. But if they don't appreciate and understand marriage as a vocation as early as their courtship stage, they're wasting their time already. <laughs> they're already wasting their time. And that's the reason why many of our teens fall off the grid. <laughs> Fall off the path. Because we're starting late. We're already preparing them for marriage just when they're engaged. Wrong! If parents are not going to teach them in their own homes, well, at least you want to do PSR classes, you want to do marriage preparation courses, start while they're teenagers. Start when they're just courting each other. Start to put in their minds, marriage is a vocation. It is not a playground. Marriage is a vocation. Another thing we need to do is have a continuing program. After they get married, what do we do? We abandon them? After they get married? <laughs> That's just the start of the challenge. So let us have continuing, uh, continuing programs after they get married to help them along the way. Many families need this. And this is where parishes can help, can support. I have been giving this suggestion for many years now, it seems like it has fallen on deaf ears. I don't know where it went. But folks, those of you who are responsible for forming souls and forming families, take a closer, deeper look at the job you're doing because we have plenty of work to do. Okay. I hope you have a good day and hope your families be blessed today. But let's do our part. Okay? Thank you, everybody. Let's go to Mass. Bye. Bye. Have a good day.